Welcome inside the RX Muscle Studios for another episode of Ask Dave, better known as hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. This is the November 9th episode in the year 2016. We will be fully transparent. This was pre recorded on Thursday, October, rather Wednesday, October 26th. Uh, obviously, we have undergone a move to Florida, so if you're watching this and assuming nothing catastrophic happened, Dave and Johnny right now are in Florida, I'm in New York, and life goes on. But this is, again, the 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competition, as we head into the offseason, all your questions life whatever it is all on the table as we bring in dave palumbo dave uh, again this is a pre-recorded so assuming nothing happened you right now are sitting in florida that's right that's right <laughs> you know i wanted to show everyone i got my new bracelet on you cannot fail you mm. cannot fail.com my friend uh, uh, <clears throat> this is a good story i know a lot of you guys like to know my story from my past i don't know if i've ever told the story i, I might have told it briefly but when i was 17 i had a, a ruptured appendix and i was in the uh, snyder's children's hospital at long island jewish hospital in Manhasset, and I was in the bed next to me was an Olympic pole vaulter by the name of Jerry Cahill, who also happened to be a model for Pierre Cardin. Uh, the reason he was in the children's hospital at 28 years old was that he had cystic fibrosis, and usually cystic fibrosis people don't live long. I believe he might be the longest living cystic fibrosis patient now. Uh, he's almost, I think he just turned 60 years old. He had a, a, a double lung transplant in, uh, four years ago, and he's like the poster child for, for CF. He was the first guy to ever get me into doing, you know, health shakes. I can't really say protein shakes because back in the, uh, in the 80s, there really weren't any protein shakes. But he had me doing brewer's yeast and, and soy lecithin and all kinds of other, you know, like superfoods. And he taught me how to eat. I was eating ice cream cones in, in, in the hospital. My grandmother was bringing me in. He's like, what, you want to be an athlete? And he made a huge impact on me at that point in, in my life. And um, uh, my mom had just passed away about two years earlier than that. And uh, he was super inspirational. He had a Nike contract. He, he actually came to my house about three weeks after we got out of the hospital, and he brought me a pair of Nike waffle racers. I remember because I was running cross-country at the time, and he gave them to me for free. And he didn't have to do that. He just was a super nice guy. And he made such an impact that I kind of, you know, now that Facebook's around, I kind of reconnected to him. I don't even know how I remembered his name, but uh, we became friends, and I sent him some of my supplements. And he's, he sent me a couple inspirational books he's written. And uh, uh, He's, he's amazing, the guy. You should check out his Facebook page, uh, Jerry Cahill. Uh, the guy is just, like I said, he does not believe in failure. And uh, I know a lot of guys out there get discouraged. They tear a muscle. They hurt themselves. Something goes wrong in their life. If this guy can make it, anyone can make it. You cannot fail.com. Check it out. Just for full transparency, these questions that we're going to be asking today are already asked uh we're not going to be able to take questions live on this episode for obvious reasons so we're going to be taking questions from our instagram page if you're not already following us it is official underscore rx muscle our facebook page and on twitter questions that are asked using the hashtag ask dave let's go to matt underscore gren underscore ramos dave love the show i'm 47 years old though i have never competed in my life um he wants to know, I, I guess his question is about sperm count. His wife, uh, he, he and his wife, are, I'm trying to see if he has competed. Um, but he says his lifestyle is like a bodybuilder, but I guess what they're trying to, they're trying to get pregnant. Right. Well, everyone knows, everyone knows that I have a, a baby-making protocol. I developed it before I even was interested in having uh, Logan, my son. Uh, I knew it would work. Uh, I had a lot of guys have terrific success with it. And, you know, what I tell people is when you're ready to have a kid, you know, do your cycles, do your hormone replacement. When you're ready to have a kid, you go off all your stuff, including hormone replacement. You can't be on steroids. It just suppresses you too much. You take um, 2,000 units of HCG every other day, and you take 75 units, or I use, of uh, human menopausal gonadotropin, HMG. Um, and that, that stimulates sperm production better than HCG does. And then you take 50 milligrams of Clomid per day as well to t help really keep your pituitary gland cranking out the signal to keep your, your testicles producing. The key is produce testosterone and sperm in the testicles. When you take exogenous sources of testosterone, it shuts down that process from occurring. 
if you do this right and follow the protocol continuously, within three months, you should absolutely be pregnant. And if not, there could be something else wrong. Let's go to Revolution OLM. When using Tren, uh, Tren A, what techniques do you, do you recommend so injections won't be so painful? Is mixing Tren with another oil a good way? I never had any problems with uh, Tren acetate being painful. I, that's new to me. If it's painful for you, you might, whoever's making it for you or wherever you're getting it, might not be balancing the pH correctly. However, a lot of people are annoyed by the fact that trend acetate causes a, the, what we call the trend cough a lot of times. You take a shot, and all of a sudden you feel like you're, you're, you can't breathe and you're coughing something out. Uh, I believe it's the preservative in the trend blown acetate because otherwise it would happen with all steroids. And I think it's what it's happening is the the preservative is trying to leave your lungs and you're trying to suck oxygen in and there's like a there's a mix up there so you're trying to cough the the, the preservative out while you're trying to breathe in and, and it just you you gag basically for air. Um, I experimented with different things. Uh, I felt that if you injected the trembolone further away from your lungs, it didn't you didn't get as much of or as dramatic of of an effect. So glute shots tended to be better than lat shots or delt shots. Let's go to Sing Sembi. I hate this show as much as Dave hates his snakes. That makes no sense. <laughs> what can be an ideal first cycle for a guy under 25 for lean gains? And what are Dave's views on metformin? You know, again, Sid, you must even remember this now by now. Uh, metformin questions have been huge lately. and um, It's trending. I, yeah. Metformin is a an insulin sensitizer. As we know, everyone's completely obsessed with insulin. I don't know why. It doesn't build muscle. It's just, you know, it drives nutrients into the muscle cells. More likely than not, though, it drives nutrients into the fat cells and makes people fat. Metformin will reduce, will increase the amount of insulin receptors on the cell membranes, thus theoretically reducing the need for as much insulin, which is good because that could help with fat burning because, or it could at least prevent you from getting fat by overproducing insulin. The problem with metformin is that it inhibits IGF-1 release, Okay. Uh, by blocking IGF-1, it's inhibiting some of the growth uh, potential that you get from growth hormone or just your natural growth hormone production. So for a bodybuilder, I wouldn't take metformin. Uh, that, that, to me, is a no-no. Novodex causes the same thing, tamoxifen. That's uh, luckily why a male, m nowadays men don't really need to take tamoxifen. We take Arimidex or Femara or Romacin. And those don't have that effect. So we don't want to block IGF-1 release. And, you know, it's interesting because people found out the f about the fact that metformin inhibited IGF coincidentally because they found that people who were on it legitimately, uh, if they had actively growing cancer in their body, it seemed to go away or at least slow down its growth. And they couldn't figure out why metformin had this cancer-like alleviating effect. And then they elucidated the mechanism eventually, and it was because it suppresses IGF, and IGF-1 can stimulate tumor growth So, uh, yeah, in, in an actively growing tumor. It's not going to create new tumors. And so I think that, that, that that's a pretty interesting topic. Now, there was a question before the metformin. Um, uh, ideal first cycle for first a guy cycle. under 25 looking for lean gains. You know, I always tell people for a first cycle, use as little as possible because anything you take is going gonna, is gonna to help you respond. So 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams of Anavar per day, 25 milligrams of, of Winstrel per day, oral, uh, do that for 12 weeks. I guarantee you'll grow. Let's go to Hulk Strong 92 Dave, your opinion about generic growth hormone. Look, growth hormone is theoretically growth hormone. If it's real, whether it's generic or name brand, it's the same thing. One IU equals one IU. The problem arises when you get this stuff from China where people are getting powder, raw powder, and they're cutting it up, and you're not getting full dose or you're not getting anything. The problem with the growth hormone is you can't check it. There's no verification test for growth hormone. Whereas for the steroids, for anabolic steroids, now Bill Llewellyn developed a kit that I sell exclusively on DavePalumbo.com. It's called Roid Test. You can identify exactly what you're taking. So if you think you got Anavar and you test it and you find out it's methyl test, you know. There's no test yet for, for, uh, for a growth hormone. I'm working with Bill on trying to get him to find a way to test if you have real growth hormone, if you have real HCG, if you have real um, – I guess you can test for HCG with using a pregnancy test. But to see if you have real IGF-1, he hasn't been able to uh, manufacture something like that. But this, for steroids, you can check it out. 
Let's go to, we have a question here. I'm going to message Johnny before I ask this question so he could see if he could pull up this video. But first, we're going to go to Center Stage Fitness. Dave, what do you go by when it comes to ounces equals an amount of protein? Example, one ounce chicken breast equals X amount of protein. It's about, it's about 8 to 10 uh, grams of protein per ounce. So if you're eating, say, 8 ounces of protein, you're getting about... Yeah, maybe it's a little less. It's, you're probably getting it's probably like seven to eight. You get about fifty to fifty-five to sixty grams of protein per eight ounces uh, of of a protein source. So, and depending on what you're eating, it could be more or less. Fish on a on a on an ounce for gram ratio is is higher. So if you're eating like eight ounces of fish, you're going to get sixty grams of protein. If you're eating and red meat is lower. If you're eating eight ounces of red meat, you're probably getting 45 grams of protein because red meats, chickens, they have more, they have more fat, whereas fish is a leaner source. So for a smaller portion, you're going to get much more protein extracted from it. Building my masterpiece. Uh, Dave, what are good supplements to boost immunity to prevent getting sick or lessen the chances of getting sick? You know, the old, the old faithful vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams three times a day, keeps the doctor away, they say – you know, it's hard to say what's going to boost the immune system. To me, I like a good plant and vegetable extract product. I use a product called Juice Plus. Um, I think it's terrific for the immune system. I think that um, a lot of people think fish oil and uh, is good for the immune system. It actually suppresses your immune system, believe it or not, because of the anti-inflammatory effect, which not is not significant. But if you're sick, you know, I don't know. You know, it, it, there's really nothing out there that I would say definitely take this. It's going to help you get better faster. I think just taking a good multivitamin, multimineral, the right amount of essential fatty acids, I think you do that and you get enough rest, I think that that's the best way to boost your immune system. All right, so let me scroll up, get this question. Um, it's about Hani Rambod, and he did – all right, you know what? Uh, Johnny has a video, so Hani Rambod uh, posted a video on Instagram with Big Rami. Let's take a listen first. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get that. I'll go to the next question first. Um, v. Abdul Majid, how do you know if nutrients are being delivered to the muscle? And, and the second part of it is, is insulin and carbs uh, and sensitivity. Let's go to the first one. How do you know if nutrients are being delivered uh, to the muscles? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's empirical. You know, you're watching yourself. I mean, are you growing? Are you recovering? Do you feel good? Um, that's the only way you can really tell. There's no way to like put a microscope inside your muscle cells and see if the amino acids are being delivered to the muscle. If you're recovering from your workouts and you feel stronger and you're getting bigger, it's working. You're absorbing it. Uh, t -t 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 Johnny, do you have that video up? Okay, let's go. The one where he's with uh, Big Rami. Oh, okay, okay. Um, let's go to Rich Aesthetics. Would you include carb depleting and loading in that statement? He says, you know, no kooky shit the week before a show. Would you include carb depleting and loading uh, as part of that sentiment? Is a part of which sentiment, though? As far as not doing anything kooky the week before a show. Oh, yeah, I carb load. Yeah, I, I, I don't do, like, crazy, crazy depletions or crazy, crazy carb ups. There's no reason for that. Um, what I'll, I'll usually carb deplete people about six, starting seven, six or seven days out. For at least three or four days, and usually the last anywhere from the last one to three days, I'll carb them up depending on who they are. Women, I usually carb up for one day. Men, I'll carb up for two days if they if they need it. I'll do three days with them. So it, it's dependent on wh how the person looks and how big they are and how fast they metabolize carbohydrates. All right, Johnny does have the video, so let's watch. Uh, this is Hani Rambod in Kuwait with Big Rami. All right, everyone, we're here in Kuwait. I'm with three-time Men's Physique Olympia champion, Jeremy Buendia. We're here doing our appearances, and we're talking about who we're gonna bring on for classic men's physique. And it's been a tough decision, but due to the IFBB pro who's just been injured, that uh, we've decided to bring on somebody who we think can take that division. And I wanna introduce you to him right now. <laughs> Good job, man. I'm busy, guys. What do you think? <laughs> yes, yeah. so men's physique, uh, classic physique. I think you can take on Sadiq. What do you think? Yeah, I'm killing him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, take care, brother. I'm coming. 
So I guess All right, the, everyone, we're hearing the question was uh, obviously it seems as if they're joking around, but the question is um, is Rami switching camps and going to Hani Rambad? What do you what do you know? First of all, I got to say right off the bat, if I ever did that video, Rami would lose th six months' pay from from from, from Weeder AMI probably, and I and I would lose my press passes. But regardless, no, I think that Hani's just goofing around with with Rami and Rami's having a good time they were all eating together obviously in a foreign country and they were having a good time um, I you know I, I'm all for that and matter of fact I think that that the stars should be able to do crossover type you know Facebook fun stuff like that it's one thing you know maybe you can't interview him right after a show but come on man this is the age of social media man you could do it Everyone should be available to do anything at any time. That's that's my belief. And I, and I don't think Rami did anything wrong, and I don't think that Rami would leave Chris Cedar. I think he's very happy. Professor Gaines, Dave, I did three contests this year in an eight-week window. The first contest was my best showing, and I got progressively worse each show. Do you have any tips for staying consistent during a contest season? I never did anything kooky, nor did I push any limits with gear or diuretic use. This is what happened. You know, if you talk to a boxer, okay, who peaks for a boxing event, okay, he's not going to go and box two weeks later again. Because what happens is you, you train, you train, you train, you diet, you diet, you diet, and you peak your body out. And if you do it perfectly and you actually hit your mark, you try to do it again too many weeks in a row, you get worse. You, ca you can't – you have to de-peak before you can re-peak again. So a lot of times, you know, I tell guys you can do shows back to back to back – but after a while, your body's just not going to respond anymore, and you're not going to get better, and you're going to look worse. So you have to understand that. I always used to try to do two shows and arrange my shows like one week right after another. Um, or do a show, take six or eight weeks off, and then do another show, So, which is very hard because, you know, it's like how do you go back to dieting after you just, just finished the contest diet eight weeks ago? But guys, do it. I, personally, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a good idea to do show after show after show, especially if you peaked for the first one. Let's go to CS Joy 77 Dave, how can you control really high estrogen even when taking Rimidex 1 milligram, when taking exogenous test and your test levels are high? How long would you expect your estrogen to decrease into the normal range when increasing Rimidex 1 mg every day? It's a tough question to answer, and I'll tell you why. Because everyone responds to aromatase inhibitors differently. There's no, like, set in stone... I take a half a milligram a day of a Rimidex, and I get this effect from it. I know guys that take a half an Rimidex two times a week and have no estrogen in their body. I know guys who take one milligram every day, and they have a ton of estrogen still showing up. And sometimes, sometimes so bad that I have to switch them to, like, letrozole or Femara or Aromacin and see if that'll work. And a lot of times I have to go high on those dosages. So everyone aromatizes differently. I don't. I hardly ever aromatize, and I don't know if it was because I used a lot of Teslac back in the day, and they said Teslac, it was a, it was an anabolic steroid that actually acted as an aromatase inhibitor, and they said that it had permanent aromatase inhibiting effects. I don't know if that's really what happened, but I'll tell you one thing: I don't take any aromatase inhibitors now. I'm not on anything, and even when I was on hormone replacement, my estrogen was always normal. Let's go to uh, intriguing question about yourself uh, from David Golsh. Dave, a big fan, can't wait, uh, I guess he's in Florida, can't wait till you get down to the Sunshine State. I can't believe you never turned pro. Can you talk about what competition you had the chance to turn pro and what happened? Um, I had a couple shot, a couple close calls. Uh, in 2002, I placed second behind Tony Freeman at the Nationals, and I, I didn't think I was going to win that show. Although I didn't think I was going to, I thought I'd beat Tony. I, did, I thought that I was going to have more trouble with Eric Fromm, who's no longer with us. Um, he died, and, and, and Matt Duvall, and he's no longer with us either. Those Both guys died, but I thought that they were actually the guys I was really going to have trouble with. And um, it turned out Freeman was the one who wound the, won winning the show. But I wasn't disappointed because it was the highest placing I had gotten to date. Uh, in 2003, I lost to uh, Chris Cook at the USA. And I remember <laughs> J.M. Mannion told me at the time his son Tyler was – was like a little kid and his son Tyler was watching the show and he's like how come that guy didn't win meaning me <laughs> and so I, I always thought that was pretty humorous because it was on TV and everything like that I, I, I believe it was on uh, ESPN or something like that and that hurt the most that was the f only show that after the show I didn't go out I didn't I didn't you know celebrate I was just completely wiped out 
demoralized. I thought that was for sure the show I was going to win uh, because I didn't think Chris was not that good at the show. He was really good the year after, but he was not good at that show. He was off. He was a little soft. They were filming him for a documentary. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. I thought that that was the year that I was going to get it. After that, I kind of it blew, took the steam out of me, and I, I think that that really was the end. I competed in 04. I didn't do that great, and, I, and that was when I retired after that. But um, 03 was, I think, the pinnacle of, of what I was able to bring to the stage. Fire of God, when sore from a major body part, is it okay to train another major body part, or should one take time to recover from soreness to work out again? Yeah, I think if you're sore, your body's giving you a signal to take off, to take a rest. Training another body part is not going to help the sore body part get better because now your body's tr focused on repairing two body parts. So if you're – look, I've trained really sore, and I actually felt better after the workouts, but if you're like – like you just know something is not right, don't go to the gym. It, it's not going to kill you to take an extra day off. You're watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Let's go to David Upton84. Dave, what are your do's and don'ts when it comes to intermittent fasting, and what are your thoughts on running a ketogenic diet while intermittent fasting? Um, I'm not a big believer necessarily for bodybuilders who are competitive of intermittent fasting because I think the periods where you're not eating are too long and I think that it can put you into a catabolic state. I do like intermittent fasting, I think, for health purposes and longevity purposes. Like I eat, like you, I try, not every day it happens. I try to eat only 12 hours out of the day. The other 12 hours I don't eat. And that's what I would call an intermittent fast. And I do that because for health purposes, my body has time to detoxify itself. If I was competing with my metabolism, especially, I I never I didn't go three hours without eating. I would wake up in the middle of the night and have meals. So you have to kind of determine what's your goal. If your goal is to add muscle, you better not be missing that many meals. You better not be going that length of time without eating. If your goal is to be, uh, you know, just healthy and you're looking to like detoxify yourself, give your organs of digestion, like the liver and kidneys a rest, I think intermittent fasting is great. Two-part question from Andrea Salupis. We'll take the first. When cutting, what type of training method you recommend, and what about sets and reps? Um, when you're cutting, you know, I, I, people might not believe me, but when I would be on a diet, getting ready for a show, I never, I didn't change my training. If I squatted 600 pounds, I would try to squat 600 pounds, you know, pre-contest. You know, if I couldn't do that much because my, my strength went down a little, I would do 500, you know, for squats. I didn't change because I always was under the belief, and I, I, Ronnie Coleman and I have discussed this, and Dorian as well. If you lifted heavy weights to get what you are today, why would you reduce the weights and increase the reps and change your regimen pre-contest? You're asking to lose muscle. Um, train as heavy and as intensely as you can. If your training intensity and your strength go down a little bit because you're on lower carbs, then cut back your weight a little bit, but don't do it purposely. I think that's a big mistake people make. The second part of his question, what is your uh, definition or interpretation of high-intensity training, uh, less rest time between sets with heavy weights, six to eight reps, or something else? I, I believe in, in rest because I don't think you can lift maximal weights, which is what's building muscle, if you don't rest in between sets. Having said that, I like to lift – as heavy as possible for four to six. I think that's the growth range. Four to six reps. Any less than that, you're really not going to grow. You're just developing strength. Any more than that, and, you, and you're, I think you're jipping yourself. If you're doing 10, 12, 15 rep sets, I think there's no way you're lifting maximal weights. It's impossible. Maybe only Ronnie Coleman could do something like that. But don't use him as, as an example because he's a genetic freak, maybe the best bodybuilder of all time. So I would get into the gym. I would warm up a little, and then I would work up to my heaviest sets pretty quickly with you know, maybe two to three sets per exercise. Once I got in there, I went all out. And if I didn't feel that strong on that particular day, I might do drop sets. So I might do six you know, reps with, say, you know, let's just give you, for instance, you know, 315 on the bench. And I know I normally do 405. I do, three, I do six sets or six reps with the, three, with the, um, with the 225 
on on the bar, and then I would like maybe drop down to 135 and, and bang out a couple, maybe six more reps, and really push. I wanted to work the muscle to failure. The muscle doesn't know how much weight you're lifting; it only knows how much it can handle. If you overload that that muscle, it's going to grow. But if you overload it for 20 sets, you're going to overtrain, and you're not going to re- you're not going to recover. Let's take some uh, from our Facebook page, Mike Mothersill. Dave, I hate this show so much. Because once I watch today's episode, I have to wait an entire week before I can watch another one. Not so. (laughs) If you go to our YouTube channel, you can find our entire catalog of Ask Dave episodes as well as live with Iron Rage versus Heavy Muscle TV, Muscle in the Morning, all uh, Iron Debate, all our offerings available on our YouTube channel. If you're watching us for the first time, again, this is a pre-recorded episode but if you're watching us for the first time on youtube please hit the subscribe button below like this episode and we will continue to deliver this kind of bodybuilding content for you again mike mothersill can you please give us some tips on managing blood pressure while on cycle is a slight elevation of blood pressure acceptable and if so how much Look, the problem with high blood pressure is that they call it the silent killer. And the reason it's the silent killer is because it slowly, over time, damages your kidney tubules. Why? Because the kidneys are a filter. And the pressure going through the kidney tubules to filter out the the waste products, okay, is dictated by your blood pressure in your body. If that pressure is high on this filtering mechanism, it can damage it. And when the filtering mechanisms start to get damaged, you're going to notice your creatinine and BUN levels, which is a measure of waste in your blood, elevating. When those go up beyond, you know, 1.3, now your your kidneys are not functioning optimally. That's dangerous, okay? You do not want your kidneys to be damaged, especially whether you're a bodybuilder or anything, for that matter. So I think a lot of people should make that mistake. Of, of ignoring it because it doesn't they don't feel any symptoms from it but high blood pressure is a really dangerous thing and if you don't want to lose your kidneys to a kidney transplant or worse death make sure you check your blood pressure and if you do check it and you find that you're high let your doctor put you on a mild ACE inhibitor like ramipril lisinopril no side effects and you're going to be protected we're going to take a couple of more questions uh let's go to kevin frassard uh, long, I hate this show. What are your thoughts on DHEA? I've been experiencing issues with always being tired, fatigued. Uh, it's been going on for several months now. Based on some Googling that I've done, a possibility that come up uh, is decreased DHEA. I'm 33 years old, have been training for 19 years, completely drug-free. Would really appreciate your input on this or anything you might be able to add to the matter. Um, DHEA is a, good, is a great um, hormone replacement type of a, of, of a supplement uh, because, you know, your adrenal glands produce DHEA, which is the, which is the androgen, which is the hormone of, that builds muscle in women. Because remember, women don't have testicles. So their testosterone or their andro- man, you know, muscle-building hormones come from the adrenal glands. And the part of the adrenal glands that comes from is the adrenal medulla and, the, and, and, and actually it might be the cortex. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to misquote you guys. I like to be accurate. The bottom line is that the adrenal androgen, specifically DHEA, can convert to um, can convert to hormones that then convert to testosterone. What happens is DHEA converts to androstenedione, dione, which converts to testosterone. And and so in women's body, the DHEA is the muscle building hormone. So I always tell women who tell me they have a bad sex drive, they want to put a little more muscle, try 25, 50 milligrams of DHEA per day. And most women get good results from that. For men, you can use up 100 to 300 milligrams a day. But really, with the hormone replacement out there so readily available now, I say do you're better off doing 100 milligrams of testipionate you know, every two weeks or even every week. Um, for hormone replacement levels. Robert Vogel, Dave, what is the main difference when you prep women clients versus men clients for a contest? Um, there really isn't. I think women are a little more intense, so that's it's good. I mean, I get I usually I like working with women because they they will listen to anything you tell them to do. They're really you know they'll ask questions, but they're 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 very dedicated to the craft, and I, I get a lot of pleasure out of helping them. Um, obviously. The women's divisions don't have the level of uh, maybe competition and prize money that the men's do, but to me, it's just as exciting. I mean, when I helped Sheila play second at the uh, the the, uh, the Rising Phoenix uh, Women's Pro uh, Bodybuilding Championships, I felt like I was up there with her. It was great. So I think the women are good, but remember, the same science applies to women and men: how to lose weight, how to build muscle, how to train. So don't try to reinvent the engine. 
there's nothing to recreate. We have one more question, and the question is about Kevin Lavroni. Should he decide to switch to classic physique? How do you see him faring? He'll get destroyed. He'll get destroyed. People think I'm like a Kevin Lavroni hater now. I didn't know what Kevin looked like before the Olympia. Once I saw what he looked like, his legs, that is, I realized that he was not the bodybuilder that he used to. And I, I bowed down to freaking Sean Ray. I even I admitted I was wrong, but I made an uninformed decision. I don't think that Kevin will do well at classic physique. I think he's a freak. I, I think he needs mass on his body in order to compete in the uh, environment that's out there today. Uh, I don't think at 52 years old, seeing his legs, that they're going to come back enough that he's going to be significant. And I think the classic physique division is chock full of these young freaking guys with amazing genetics. And Kevin doesn't have the waistline he had when he turned pro back in the 90s. So I, I think it's a bad decision. On that note, we are going to conclude this episode of Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. For Dave Palumbo and Johnny Styles. I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next week.